Okay, thank you for everybody for logging on and thank you for this opportunity. With the, the recent outbreak of, of vesicular stomatitis going uh, through our horses in the, in the eastern part of the state, um, I thought it would be a good idea to spend just a few minutes about talking about that current outbreak as well as talking about some of the requirements that we have as we're traveling with horses throughout the state. So we'll talk about interstate and intrastate travel, the paperwork that's required for those, those uh, traveling. Um, and if we have time, we can talk a little bit about nutrition, especially for the traveling horse, as well as some of the, the common first aid things that we need. But we'll, we'll cover the first one first and take as much time as we can or as we need to at that point in time. If we have time for the others, we will. So to begin, um, with the current outbreak that's going on, there's a few different places where you can go to get uh, up to date and, and as current as we can information. This equinedisease.org uh, place is a place where you can go for any equine disease. Um, it's a site that's free for everyone to sign up with. Uh, you enter your email and they will send you an email for every disease outbreak. But if you come here, you can put vesicular stomatitis. Uh, you can click on your own state and it gives you updates as far as what's going on. What I like about this, they're always including the, the uh, government um, update on what's going on throughout the state. And if we look here, we look down to Utah, we, we currently have these counties that are affected, the number of premises that are affected, and, and the other things that are going on there. If we look at it, in Utah, it is only horses that we are seeing it so far. We have not seen it in cattle. Um, in a phone conversation with the state yesterday, they talked about that we only have two counties with quarantines left, in Duchesne County and Uinta County. However, that can change at any point in time. Another site that I like to, uh, if I can get my mouse to work, let me go back there. Another one that I like to look at is the Utah or the ag.utah.gov. And you can scroll down here to the animal industry and it'll give you an up to date with specific Utah laws that are, that are coming into effect and the other updates that they may have at this time. So as we talk about that, are there, are there any questions there about that vesicular stomatitis outbreak? Although I'm not an expert on the, the current outbreak, is, does anybody have questions there? Hey, uh, Carl, when you talked to them at the state, did they give any indication when they, when they think that uh, those, those uh, travel quarantine restrictions will be list, listed on those premises? Um, they did not. She was not able to give me that information and, and Dr. Pittman was not available at the time. So I don't know when the quarantines will be lifted. I do know that the, the general idea there is two weeks after the, the newest case has come up. So a minimum of two weeks from when the quarantine started. Do you have any more information there, Carrie? Uh, no, I don't. I was just sort of wondering, and I haven't seen anything from the Department of Agriculture on that, but uh, uh, that could affect, you know, the state fair obviously is going on now. But, yep. Uh, if I remember right, there's a fall, a late fall show too. In two weeks, well, yeah, two weeks yeah. from now, we have the State 4-H show. Right. Show, right. The State 4-H horse show. Um, it could affect some of the, the people traveling from th those areas. The only restrictions that we have are from premises that are quarantined. So if that specific farm or that specific premise is under quarantine, nothing in and out. But there is no regional quarantine. There is no regional um, they did say there are no regional restrictions on any horses traveling at this time. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's, let's talk for a minute. And then as we get on, we'll talk about the actual uh, state uh, horse show coming up in a few weeks when we get down to the end of this travel part. But if we look at interstate travel requirements. Carl, Carl, 
we've got one of our participants that has a, I think maybe a question or a statement. Okay. Uh, looks like Dave says there were some as suspect goats or sheep. Okay. And I think one or two premises with suspect cattle. The last okay. I knew the USDA was testing samples from those species. Does anyone know if the secular stomas titus virus was confirmed or ruled out in those species? Uh, I don't. The only thing that I have seen is that August 29th. And I know that is 12 days, two weeks outdated. But if we, if we look at the, uh, the national one, the, the, the USDA APHIS report, um, it was, when was that date? August 29th, the situation report. As of that time, all it was in Utah were horses. We could see by this graph right here. But that doesn't mean it hasn't happened since then. Does that answer that question? I think it does, unless Dave wants to unmute his mic and ask, but. Uh... Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go on here. So as we're traveling around the state, so inside the state of Utah, you are required to carry proof of ownership of your horse. Now, we'll talk about that in the next slide um, as far as what entails proof of ownership. Also, you may have individual event requirements. Now, let's take into account what's happening at the state 4-H horse show here in two weeks. We have met or we have taken the advice of our state vet. We've also followed the, the advice of the American Association of Equine Practitioners and we've implemented some biosecurity protocols. So to come to that individual requirement, you have to have um, proof of temperature for three days. You have to have a, an inspection by a veterinarian within 72 hours prior to coming to the event saying this horse does not show any signs of a, a, a disease that may be transmissible to other animals. So that being said, um, the individual event requirements, it's the owner's responsibility to know what those requirements are. And those can be anywhere from a 72 hour certificate of veterinary inspection to um, the temperature requirements that we've talked about, talked about to a negative Coggins and all of those different things. So it's not necessarily uh, law that you have that veterinary inspection while traveling within your state, but your, your uh, event requirements may require that. If your premises is under quarantine, that does mean you cannot travel anywhere, no horses in and no horses off of that premises until that official quarantine has been lifted. Okay, so when we talk about acceptable proof of ownership, and I always like to, uh, for some reason my mouse doesn't show up sometimes, it goes to sleep. But I, I always like to go to the state's definition of acceptable proof of ownership. And if we look down here on number C, it says when traveling anywhere within the state always carries proof of ownership. This could include a brand inspection, certificate or auction invoice showing where you purchase the animal. A bill of sale will not be accepted as proof of ownership. Also, you can carry a wallet sized brand card matching the brand on that horse. So if you have a registered brand and you're carrying that brand card saying, this is my brand, anything with this shows proof of ownership. Also, they have what they call lifetime or yearly travel permits. These are the traditional brand inspections that you can get from the brand inspector. We'll go through that here in just a minute, a little bit more in depth. And then I, I always look here at, at the last bullet there. If you are transporting horses that belongs to someone other than yourself, you have to carry written permission from the owner, as well as one of these other proofs of ownership. So I, I think that's an interesting one. I, I haven't ever heard of anyone getting a ticket for those, but I, I found that interesting that, that they had that up here. So those are proof of ownership. Um, and, and I found it interesting that a bill of sale is not considered an acceptable proof of ownership. So just remember that. 
The other thing here is when horses require an ownership inspection. Too many times we call that a brand inspection and so everybody, well, someone will say, well, my horse doesn't have a brand, therefore I don't need a brand inspection. That's not accurate. You need to have a brand inspection or an ownership in inspection to validate or to prove that you have the right to buy or sell this horse. So, or to transport this horse in this case. So in this instance, no, first one there, before moving the horse out of the state, whether or not a change of ownership is involved. Also, before selling a horse at an auction or when a horse is sold at a private treaty, you have to, as the seller, provide that inspection by a brand inspector saying that this horse, I have a legal right to sell this horse. The other thing that we often see sometimes is owners believe that if I have my brand card and that horse is carrying my brand, I can then cross state lines. However, you cannot. You have to have that inspection, that, tr that travel permit from the brand inspector. Okay, so let's move on. We've talked about these. Hey, Carl, oh, yes. That there was a lot of discussion over the last year through the legislative session and into maybe a year and a half ago about this brand inspection program in the state of Utah. Yep. And so they're in the process now. They've got new brand director and, and new folks at UDAF. Yep. That seem to revamp that. Has there been any substantive changes to either the price for a brand inspection or anything about the process of the brand inspection for horse owners? Yes, uh, the, the changes occur in the pricing. As far as I'm aware, there were no other changes. They still require brand inspection. That was one of the questions is, were they going to do away with brand inspections for horses? But yeah, I remember that discussion, right, yes. yeah. And they did not do away with it. It is still required. I have a, a chart here and a few more slides that gives oh, okay. a rundown of the, the price changes okay. that occurred, but not nothing else changed from my understanding. Thank you. I know it was quite a discussion and, yep. and uh, on all sides. Interesting. Yep. The other thing is acceptable proof of ownership. Uh, breed registration papers in the owner's name were accepted as, as proof of ownership. And the other one is if a young foal is still nursing its mother and you have an acceptable proof of ownership for the mother then that that foal is is covered under that that mother's proof of ownership but if the animal is weaned you have to have its individual proof of ownership so so that's our the necessity of traveling within the state any any questions about that okay We'll move on to interstate. So this is where we're actually crossing a state line. When we're crossing a state line, we actually have two governing bodies. First of all, we have the state that we are entering and their idea is to protect the health of the livestock within its boundaries. The second entity is the state that you are leaving and their main goal is to protect the livestock from within its boundaries from theft. And so we have two different groups that we, we need to be looking at here. So let's talk about the state that you're entering. What requirements do they have? And, and for instance, if I'm traveling with my horses from Utah into Wyoming, I do that quite often because I'm from Wyoming and I take horses back and forth to my dad. He brings horses back and forth to me. I am proud to say that since I've become a veterinarian, he is much more legal in his transportation. So we're, we're excited about that small victory. But first of all, there has to be a negative equine infectious anemia test, EIA, or the traditional Coggins test is what it's referred to as. But the states will, will vary, either they're six months or 12 months. And most of them in the surrounding area here is within the last 12 months. So you have to have almost a yearly Coggins test done on your horse. That Coggins or negative EIA test must be listed on the certificate of veterinary inspection with the ascension number on that um, CVI. The other thing that is required uh, as, you're, as you're crossing state lines by the 
state that you're coming into is a certificate of veterinary inspection. Traditionally, or, or most of the time when there's not current outbreaks going on, those can be, they have to be within 30 days. Um, by letter of the law, they are single use, single destination. So if I'm traveling from here to Afton, uh, it's a single use, so the only one time, and it's only good to Afton. So there's, there's those thoughts there. Now, that can change at any time. And the veterinarian, as you take your horse in to be inspected by the veterinarian, the veterinarian's responsibility is to contact that state or to look at their website to make sure that all of the specifics are being met. And we'll talk about a few of the variations that may come about because of the, you know, the disease status if there's an outbreak. The state that you're leaving, um, their, their concern is to protect the livestock within its boundaries from theft. And so they require an ownership inspection or a brand inspection on every animal leaving the state. So even if you have a brand on your horse and you carry the brand card, if you're leaving the state, you have to have a travel permit or a brand inspection on that horse. Okay, certificate of veterinary inspection. They require a few things, and these are requirements. It's not the veterinarian setting these rules, it's the states that you're coming into. You must have a physical address for the origin and the destination. They do not allow you to have a P.O. box um, as that destination. That gets a little tricky sometimes when we've got individuals who are traveling to Wyoming or traveling to Idaho or traveling here to Utah, if they're going hunting or they're going for a ride in an area that's big and does not have a physical address, I've talked with these states and they ask that we put the trailhead or the hunting area that you're, you're going to. They want to know as specifically as possible what's happening. I had a situation this summer where I wrote a health certificate for a group of horses that were going on a trail ride. They were going up into the mountains into Idaho and I told them I needed to have a physical address. So somebody got online, they found the post office address for the closest town, and they gave me that. I didn't know what the physical address was. So then the state called me and said, hey, um, everybody went traveling to the post office right there. So anyway, it was kind of an interesting, but they want you to put the trailhead, the hunting unit that you're in, um, or, or as close as you can get to a physical address of your destination. Okay, things that may change at any time due to disease outbreaks. They may limit you to say you have to have a 72 hour inspection. So that certificate of veterinary inspection has to be done within 72 hours of your horse crossing state lines going into that, prim or into that new state. The other thing that we may be looking at is they may require an entry permit number. That is used so that they can track those horses that are, are coming in. They know where they're going, they know where they're coming in from, and it's a way that they can use that to track, the, the <clears throat> track those horses. Now, Utah has a rule right now that any horses coming into the state from a vesicular stomatitis affected state, they need to have an entry permit number. So, my dad brought some horses down last night. Yesterday, I called up the state of Utah because I am licensed in Wyoming as well. I wrote that health certificate for him. I inspected those animals over the weekend so I could inspect them at a 72 hours. And it's, well, Utah's not requiring a 72 hour at this time, but I then called in and got an entry permit number and was able to put that on the permit for them. Sometimes states will require vaccination status as well as a specific statement. And, and Utah's require, or Wyoming required that a week ago as I, or two weeks ago as I went there on a, on a, took my racehorse to be run. It says all animals identified on this certificate have been examined by me and found to be free from clinical signs of vesicular stomatitis. These animals were not located on a premises under quarantine for vesicular stomatitis at any time of my inspection. So those are some things that may change at any time. And really, this is your veterinarian's responsibility to find these out. 
but as your veterinarian finds them out, he's going to require some of this information from you as well. Here's a just a, a, a copy of the brand or the certificate of veterinary inspection that that I had to provide as I took my horse to Rock Springs to run a few weeks ago. As you can see up here, if I can get my mouse back in here to show you a few things, um, they require a physical address. So where is that horse physically located? Then they require a physical address. Where is that horse physically going? And this is the address of the racetrack in Rock Springs. Um, Wyoming did not require an entry permit number. Remember, this is a horse coming from Utah into Wyoming. So they did not require that entry permit. They did require uh, a, a, perm or a health certificate or a certificate of veterinary inspection number. And that's listed on every health or every certificate of veterinary inspection that we've got. Down here, you can see that these horses were tested for EIA. Um, they have different ascension numbers because one of my horses was done in May. This was the, the racehorse. This is the horse that travels with him. He was done in November. So when November comes around, Hondo, this particular horse, his, uh, in his uh, Coggins report is old and not valid. And so we're going to have to get a new one on him if I travel or cross state lines in after November. It also requires the, uh, the veterinarian's information down here and have a signature on those. This is the, re, the uh, statement that's required for those. These, this was obviously an electronic um, certificate of veterinary inspection. Oops. All right. Ownership inspection. <clears throat> um, here is the, uh, the link that tells you the new fees that have been implemented. And if we look down here, it it's, uh, has it for all livestock. We can look at lifetime permits on your horse. Uh, the first horse, if you have that brand inspector out, they want you to do everything as much as possible at, the, at one trip. So the first horse is $55. That is up about $20 from last year. Each additional horse after that is $35. Um, you can get a limited travel at 35 or you can get a, um, you can get a lifetime, oh, if you lose your, if you lose your lifetime permit, then you can get a new one at $10 or if you're transferring, meaning the individual that owned the horse before you had a lifetime inspection, you can then have it transferred to you for only $10. <clears throat> so those are, <clears throat> excuse me, those are some of the price changes that they've had in the, 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 just since I think July is when that changed. I, I also have a list here of the, the brand inspectors in your county or linked to the list of the brand inspectors in your county. So they are readily available. Um, there are some full-time, there are some part-time. So if you need to look at your county where you're living to, to have that uh, brand inspection occur. All right, so any questions about our, our travel requirements that, that you have? Uh, Carl, if, if, uh, if you wanted to get a brand inspection performed, and yep. you weren't able to get a brand inspector out in, a, in as timely a manner as you would like, can you drive to another county and have the brand inspector do it there? I think it has to be done by the county in which you reside. Okay. I'm, I'm not exactly sure on that. That is my understanding, but I don't know for sure. Does anybody else have any knowledge of that? I, I do think it has to be done by the, the county in which that horse resides. Um, talking about doing it in a timely manner. You've got to understand these guys are busy. Um, and they really dislike it when somebody calls them on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon saying, I just bought a horse off of KSL, or I sold my horse on KSL, and I now need to have my brand inspection. They're here to pick the horse up. Understand it may not always happen that fast. So if you know you're selling a horse, if you know you need a brand inspection, then call them, 
give them give them some days in advance. They try hard to get there as quick as possible, but they can't always drop at the or come at the drop of a hat. So, any other questions? Okay, we'll move on here for just a minute. Uh, talk a little bit about nutrition, particularly where you're traveling. The number one thing that you have to think about with your horse is water, daily requirements. On average, uh, a horse will need between 50 mil or about 50 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. They're gonna get anywhere from 2.6 to 9.2 gallons of water a day, if you do the math. When you're traveling with horses, that can go up. Horses have the ability to carry a lot of water in their digestive tract. Up to upwards of 20% of their total body weight can be water carried in their digestive tract. And they can absorb that water throughout the day. But we definitely do not want that horse to get dehydrated, especially when you're traveling. Um, be very careful because horses don't always like to drink water from a new location. Case in point, my horse at home, we have a well, so there's no Added, added supplements, there's no added chlorine or anything like that. So when I take him to a location where there's chlorine in the water, he really does not want to drink. And so we have to carry water with us when we want him to perform at, at an optimum level. Horses will drink more water when they're fed an all alfalfa diet. And so you have to think about that. And be very aware that lactating mares are gonna require 75 to 100 mils per kilogram. So they're gonna be drinking almost twice as much as, <clears throat> as a, a, a non-lactating horse. Also understand those foals that you're traveling with, if you're traveling with that horse to take the mare to be bred back to a stallion, those foals also need water aside from what they're nursing off their mom. So it's, it's important that you have water available for the foals as well. Um, horses are very efficient thermal regulators. They can sweat at these sporting events. They can sweat a lot. And they can, a, a thoroughbred, this is where a lot of the studies have been done, but a thoroughbred as they warm up, they race for one to two miles and then recovery, they could be sweating upwards of 10 liters of water, or of, of sweat. So water and potassium and the sodium chloride there as well. And so it takes quite a bit of water to regenerate that and to replenish that so that they're not um, dehydrated. So dehydration is one of the most common problems that we see with horses. That dehydration can lead to impaction colic, poor performance, uh, and, and generalized sickness in these horses. Extended dehydration can be leading to um, kidney failure as well. So we need to be very careful there. When we're feeding our horses while they're traveling, we need to understand that horses will eat, daily requirements will be one and a half to 3% of the body weight of that horse, depending on their activity level. So at a maintenance level, a thousand pound horse is gonna be eating between 15 to 35 pounds a day. Now, generally speaking, when we're traveling with horses, they're more than a maintenance level, they're performing or they're, they're pregnant or they're nursing or, they're there for reproductive. And so it may require more energy levels. A lot of people like to travel with a hay net um, to allow that horse to eat while they're traveling. It prevents boredom, makes them so they don't get, uh, they don't get bored, start um, pawing in the trailer or have other problems. But it does provide nutrients that they need. So some basic energy requirements of these horses. An adult 1100 pound horse requires 16.65 megacalories of horse or of, of energy throughout the day. <clears throat> There's some other horses there. If we look at an adult horse in heavy work, it's up to 26 megacalories. So there's a lot of different energy requirements. And if we look at how much is provided in our forages, particularly, 20 pounds of, of cool grass or cool season mature grass hay will give you. 15 and a half megacalories of energy. Your alfalfa gives you a little bit more. It gives you 17.95. So quite honestly, uh, a horse that's in maintenance can be fed 20 pounds of alfalfa and meet those energy demands. 
but as your energy demands go up, so do your energy requirements, or so that you need to feed more um, forage, or you may need to throw in a little bit of concentrate. Concentrates such as oats, barley, corn, beet pulp, rice bran, all of those can be used to increase the energy needs of your horse. Also understand here in Utah, we have a lot of cold weather. Um, horses have what we call a, a lower critical temperature. It's a temperature that if it goes below that point, they need to produce more energy, metabolic energy, to keep their body, their core temperature up to where it needs to be. For an adult horse, an adult horse in maintenance, that, that temperature is 18 degrees Fahrenheit. For a pregnant mare and growing horses, that's 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's quite a difference there. What that's telling us is that when we hit those lower critical temperatures, we need to feed that horse more. That horse needs to consume more energy to be able to keep its body temperature where it needs to be. A good rule of thumb is for every 10 degrees um, outside of that lower critical temperature or below that lower critical temperature, we need to up their feed 15 to 20% to maintain a normal body temperature. And we have to keep that in mind as our horses are being fed during cold weather, but particularly when we're traveling with those horses during cold weather. Uh, I, I get excited about our cold weather because that's when I start running my chariot horses. We run during the winter time. <clears throat> and so we always take that into account that they're, they're eating more. Here's just another graph that talks, us, talks about <clears throat> um, being able to meet the energy requirements. So an 1100 pound horse in light workload requires 19.9 or almost 20 megacalories of energy per day. That can be met with 22.5 pounds of alfalfa. But if we get into a pregnant mare or a, a lactating mare, she is, a lactating mare has a huge energy requirement, 31 megacalories per day. That's going to be met by 33 pounds of alfalfa plus two and a half pounds of oats. She's going to be eating a lot. And so you, you've got to be thinking about that. These are just some suggestions that, that I, we don't need to get into those right now. Um, all of these have come off of this NRC 88 uh, website. That's the National Research Council where they've gone in and really, they have a really neat website right there where you can help um, design a ration for a horse. You can put in the horse's size, you can put in the horse's workload, and it helps you design a ration to meet those energy needs of that horse. Just some ideas for a, a first aid kit that you would want as you're traveling. Uh, you want to have bandaging because you'll oftentimes get cuts as you're out with your horse. Make sure you have some wound ointment, some vet wrap, that's the elastic bandage that can go around, white tape and bandage padding. These are just some basics. Uh, it, may be, it may be beneficial to have some phenobutazone to take care of any pain that if your horse goes lame, you can give them that. That, that phenobutazone is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that really helps take the edge off if you've got a lame horse. The phenobutazone and the banamine both can be purchased in um, paste form that you can administer that orally. It's really easy and it may help take care of some situations. Also have some betadine there to, to uh, take care to help disinfect a wound or to clean a wound if you've got it. Just a quick talk about colic. Colic seems to always increase um, when you're traveling. It can be due to uh, stress on the horse, it can be due to behavioral changes, it can also be due to an impaction colic when they get dehydrated. Uh, a definition of colic is abdominal pain. The horses are really susceptible to it because of the pain receptors they have in their abdomen. Um, the, the rule of thumb, if you've got a horse that's colicking, get veterinary, get them to a veterinary as soon as you can. Look for veterinaries in your area, don't, don't think that you can travel home um, and, and take care of it, get them taken care of sooner rather than later. You got a, a lot higher success rate if you get them taken care of sooner rather than later. I, ha I have some organs here that you can look at 
we won't go into the colic. Um, but as we look at colic, what are some signs that may show that your horse is, is having some uh, abdominal pain? Mild anywhere from pacing to they're up and down, they're off their feed, um, and their heart rate will be elevated all the way to, to going to moderate. They're up and down, they're pacing, they're, they're feeding, they could be down trying to roll. Mucous membranes start to change, they go pale as that horse goes into shock. If we get into a severe colic, they're rolling, they could be beating their head. You could see some abdominal distension and their, their mucous membranes can go brick red at that point in time. All of these need medical attention uh, or they can progress very rapidly and actually the horse could actually die from these. So I encourage everyone, if you see signs of colic to get medical attention, get to a veterinarian as quickly as possible. We see a lot of lacerations. The keys there is stop the bleeding, clean them out with water, wrap them up and get, a, get, your, get to your veterinarian as quick as you can. Um, sometimes they can be life-threatening if, if the amount of blood that's being lost is, is substantial. But most of the time, if you get them to a veterinarian within 24 hours, they can be sutured up. Um, antibiotics, that's gonna be at the, uh, and, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that's gonna be at the discretion of your veterinarian. When applying a, a bandage, uh, keep, clean the wound as best you can. They are now telling us not to use hydrogen peroxide on cleaning a wound. Um, water is actually really good with some pressure on it. Apply an ointment, apply a non-adherent covering, apply appropriate band or padding so that we're not damaging the, the ligaments and tendons that are underneath there. Apply, apply some brown gauze to hold that padding in place and that's when you can then put on your pressure wrap uh, that will help um, stop bleeding if you need to. Uh, know your regular vet, know your show vets. Um, hopefully those shows that you have, have a vet either that's on call or on site. Um, and another thing is before you go to an area, make sure you know those local veterinarians.